As I ex uh, explained briefly in the lightning round, we have uh, five experts here on access control and when you have to pay for access changes and when you don't. And two of the folks here from Von Briesen and Roper, if they'd raise their hands, uh, they actually are the ones who represent the developers and the property owners. So if you detect any bias, <laughs> But no, they're all, they are all experts. Uh, John Sobatek and Dwayne Harlow uh, represent the government. Dwayne Harlow from the Attorney General's office, John Sobatek from the Department of Transportation who handles, he also handles all the permit appeals. Uh, and we have Sarah Beachy who has been an Assistant Attorney General and a property owner representative and is currently representing property owners and well, both. Uh, I don't know if that indicates you're the most balanced of the bunch, but, <laughs> but uh, well, uh, that we'll entertain questions, but try to keep your question on the specific topic that that group of our pair of attorneys is addressing. Uh, this will distinguish between the U.S. Constitution and the Wisconsin Constitution and other states uh, and their takings and damages clause. U.S. Constitution is applicable to all the states, Fifth Amendment, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Language is prohibitory, phrased in the negative. Key phrases, private property, taken, public use, just compensation. Uh, two states have no constitutional takings provision, Kansas and North Carolina. I didn't know that. That's kind of strange, so they must just follow the U.S. Constitution and their statute. Uh, the other 48 states have takings provisions in their Constitution, so they have to pay for a taking just like under the U.S. Constitution. Wisconsin and Connecticut's Constitution are identical to the U.S. Constitution. They just copy it verbatim. 24 states contain both taking or damages provisions. It says if property is, private property is taken or damaged, you have to pay just compensation. And that makes a big deal of difference when you're talking about access management. Uh, here's an example of Alaska, shall not be taken or damaged for public use. Yeah, so in all 31 states, constitutions have one or more provisions beyond simply taking of property. So I caution you, everything we say will apply because of, from the US Constitution, states typically follow what the U.S. Constitution says in one fashion or another, and you can have regulatory, regulatory takings under the U.S. Constitution if you go too far. Um, why is this important to you? You may or may not have to pay for compensation when you're doing access management, depending on what your constitution, your stat, statutes, and what your policies are. Um, Case examples, like I said, from Wisconsin will apply everywhere, but only to the extent of taking. All states have an inherent and essential police powers, which is the power of the government to do regulation, which can be pretty dramatic too. Uh, police power is not a compensable event. So we'll start off with uh, John Sobatek from the Department of Transportation, and Sarah Beachy talking about police power, what it is, what it is not, uh, and we'll go through several cases that deal with the exercise of police power. There you go. Okay. Just leave it up here. I think, can you hear me back there? I'm lavaliered, so. Um, the first uh, th case we're going to talk about is a case called Sippel. And what happened with Sippel was, this is uh, City of St. Francis versus Sippel. City of uh, St. Francis is a little town. It's a suburb of Milwaukee, just south of town. Anybody here coming to Mitchell Field to get arrive here? Mitchell Field, Milwaukee? Everybody flew into Madison? Wow. Well, one person, Mitchell Field. Um, 
this property is on the northeast corner of Mitchell Field. And if you're familiar with Milwaukee, it's just to the east of the Lake Parkway, which runs basically between Mitchell Field and downtown Milwaukee. Um, it's on the corner of Pennsylvania Avenue and Whitnall. And back in, in the 70s, Sipples, the Sipples, this is a, the, the apartment building they own. And their tenants parked right along Pennsylvania Avenue here, okay? So this is one of those access management headaches. What you've got is no curb, no gutter, continuous pavement between the, high, between the roadway and the Sipple, onto the Sipples property, and the people are pu pulling up an angle parking along the side of the, of the apartments here, okay? And what happens is, this is what it looks like today, the city of St. Francis came through, put curb and gutter in, didn't take any land. There's no eminent domain action here. They just put a curb and gutter in along their roadway. And in the process did what? Cut off the parking, right? No more parking, okay? And of course, the Sipples were not happy. And if, if we look back, go back here, notice there's no parking over here back then. The Sipples didn't bother to have parking back then. And today, they've put their parking back here. So Sipples wind up with no parking here. And what do they get from the city in addition to that? Come on, who works for municipal government? Putting curb and gutter in front of a property, what are you gonna get? Come on, you've all had this. Special assessment, special benefits to the property. Okay, so not only do they lose their parking, but they get a nice bill from the city for putting in curb and gutter, okay? And the Sipples are not happy about that. So they sue this, the city of St. Francis for an inverse taking. You took my right to park here without paying me. We have a right of access to the street and you've taken it away and pay me for it, okay? Um, in the Supreme Court, the Wisconsin Supreme Court does a great job in this decision in, in one paragraph of summarizing the U.S. Constitution's law on takings, okay? They say, you can take property in one of two ways. You can take it by eminent domain, I say I'm taking it from you, or you can take it under the police power, okay? Taking by police power involves the power of government to adversely affect property without compensation, okay? You can take by eminent domain for the public good, you can take by police power when the property use is harmful to the public welfare. But the existence of a taking depends on whether, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the case of, a, of police power, depends on whether the restriction that you put on the property renders the, uh, practically or substantially renders the land useless for all reasonable purposes. Okay, so that's your constitutional standard. Am I rendering the property useless for all reasonable standards? Am I taking all value from this property when I take away this, when I close this parking under the police power? And what's the answer? No, and that's the conclusion the Wisconsin Supreme Court comes to in civil. Um, it just incidental damages to properties resulting from government activities or laws that are passed in promotion of the public welfare is not considered a taking of property for which compensation must be paid. So that's the typical thing. Unless you render that property useless, you're not going to have a taking. And this is a case where the government didn't touch the property at all. And I can tell you from, from our standpoint, as attorneys, we like that. We call that the no touch, no take. Generally, if you don't touch the property, you're not actually taking any physical property from them, you're probably not going to have a problem um, with, 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 that, uh, with, with that taking and, or have to pay compensation for that taking. Is that enough? Anybody else have thoughts on Sipple? What do you do from a, just quickly, what do you do from a design standpoint or early on, I mean, to, to sort of affect that no touch, no take? I mean, is that something you hammer early on with the engineers or? Well, right. I mean, hopefully, you know, in, in our view, 
it, it, what, what I try to encourage our staff to do, and I, is it easier to see me if I stand up? What I try to encourage our staff to do is to deal with highway access issues in the planning stage, both at the 30% and the 60% process. Our, our, you know, we, ask, we, we expect our, our access coordinators to be meeting with the real estate people and to be meeting with the designers to figure out where these kinds of problems exist and figure out how you're going to deal with them. So for example, let's suppose that we had this situation and the, the designers wanted to take one foot, a one foot strip along here. Okay? My first question to them would be, do you really need that? My life will be much easier if you don't take that. If you take a one foot strip there and take part of their parking spaces, I might wind up having to pay for that parking. In fact, I think it would be likely that we would pay for the, their loss of parking. So I would say, if you don't need it, can you move to the other side if you need an extra foot? Can you just have a shorter terrace in this space? You know, if, if, if it turns out later that we absolutely have to have it because the traffic isn't working, can we do it later? Um, figure those kinds of things out. Can I just have a sure. It was half and half. So the, the cars, I don't know if I can go back to the other slide, but uh, if you look at where the cars are, the, the case says that the, you know, kind of right in the middle of the cars is city right of way. And, and one of the things that the court says in its decision is, you know, the SIPLs want the, uh, want, want the city to pay for taking away their free use of public property over the years, we're not inclined to make them pay, make the city pay for that. So they, they point that exact factor out. To, to just quickly come at it from a different perspective here, now there was no dispute that the property owner had to incur some costs to cure the problem, right, and to add parking. Uh, Jim had mentioned earlier uh, in the, the conference that we're one of 19 states that wouldn't compensate this. In a state that requires compensation for damage to property and not taking, would this be compensable or do you not know? I, I don't know. I mean, this is an odd one because, of course, they're, I think if they weren't trespassing on the city land to start with, they wouldn't have had any parking there in the, in the, in the beginning. So I'm not sure that the damages result from the taking here so much as the loss of the, you know, let's suppose that the city had simply sued them to enjoin the trespass. Um, or to eliminate the encroachment, um, I don't think there'd be any argument that that was a taking. Did they change the access at all? The access was all access is, access points stayed the same. Yeah. The driveway connections, yeah. Okay, so the, the question was, um, I, I, I mentioned, you know, don't take, you know, if you need that one foot, let's deal with it later if we need to. And how is that going to work out in court if we actually come back in five years and have to take the one foot? At that point, we'd have to see what happens. Of course, at that point, we won't be taking any parking. So we'd probably just be buying land at that point. Get on. <laughs> There's another one here. Yeah, I guess what, one thing I would add is, um, Uh, somebody's telling me to mic up way in the back, so I'm going to make sure I do that. I also want to say... Hold your mic. Is this on? Awesome. There we go. Um, if you saw me playing with my phone, it's because there's a clock on it, and there is not a clock anywhere else in this room. I promise you I'm not checking email. And because we do have a number of uh, case studies to get through, um, I try to be mindful of the time. So let me um, go up here, and in the interest of time, I'm actually going to skip ahead to a case called J&E Investments. This is, uh, I wanna clarify something John said about uh, no touch, no take, and how you can have a taking by police power. I wanna be really clear. A police power by itself is not a taking. A police power involves the ability of the government to regulate your property or do something indirectly in the interests of health, safety, and welfare without it being a taking. 
In order for a police power or any other regulation or action to arise to the level of a compensable taking in Wisconsin or under the Wisconsin Constitution, there have to be two, one of two scenarios involved. One of those is an actual physical occupation of land. And the most common example is a diversion of water that causes flooding on someone's property. That's an actual physical occupation, and under certain circumstances it can be a taking for which the government has to pay for. But we're not here to talk about flooding, we're here to talk about access management. And so that's the second type of action that can result in a compensable taking, and that is what John was talking about, an action that essentially deprives the property of all or mostly all of the beneficial use of the property. And what we are, we're going to talk about in this next scenario is a, another business where the driveway was closed. And in fact, the driveway was closed through an act of police power. Um, how many people in this room are from Wisconsin? Nearly everybody. And by show of hands, how many of you are in some jurisdiction outside of Wisconsin? So there are a few people who are outside of Wisconsin as well. Um, your regulations, your specific statutes that govern certain situations are going to vary. But it is likely in your jurisdiction you have something like what we're about to talk about today. And uh, the other thing I want to point out is when I first joined the Department of Justice, um, I didn't do a lot of access management. I didn't work with roads a lot. And people would come in and talk about highways. They would talk about freeways. They'd say limited access, controlled access. At the very beginning, I started to realize these are all terms of art. And people use them loosely, and they use them wrongly. And in court, and in your documents that you guys are drafting, you have to be very clear that you understand what these terms are. If you say controlled access in Wisconsin, you're actually talking about a very specific statute that I'm going to talk about later, the controlled access statute. And it is a specific designation that the department can can use for highways that are especially unsafe. And that allows them the highest uh, power possible to regulate access to that particular highway if it's designated as controlled access and if they follow the procedures. A freeway has a so totally different set of procedures. Um, highways have a totally, they're a very broad definition. So in your jurisdiction, you want to be clear what these terms of art mean. All right, so j &E Investments. I don't know how well you folks can see this, unfortunately. Um, but what this property was, uh, was a, a one acre or less parcel in Milwaukee on Mayfair Boulevard. And um, this property was actually at the end of an off ramp. So the, drive, the main driveway for this property was south of the building and it was actually overlapping with an off ramp. And so cars would come off the, the interstate at, thank you, let's see, there we go. There's the main parking. This is Mayfair Boulevard. Here's the driveway, and down here is the highway. So people come off the highway, they're going 55 or 65 miles per hour, they're slowing rapidly, and someone turns to turn into this driveway, and there was a, a lot of crashes. And, and so someone at the Department of Transportation decided that this was an unsafe situation, and they used an administrative procedure, a driveway revocation, to close this driveway. Now in Wisconsin, the driveway statute is 8607, and it actually allows the DOT to send out a letter that says we've reviewed your driveway, we think it's unsafe, and we're going to revoke your driveway permit. And there's also an appeal procedure. And j and &E Investments, the owner of this property, was not happy about having their driveway revoked, and um, they said that's not fair, we're not going to have reasonable alternate access. And actually, um, Nick represented the landowners in that case, um, and his uh, partner, Alan Orkovitz. And this case actually had two stages. One was the administrative part. They appealed the administrative part. It went to the Division of Hearings and Appeals. And the DHA said, you know what? DOT, you exercised your authority properly. This really is a safety hazard. And oh, by the way, Janie, you still have reasonable access remaining. And they actually had four driveway entrances. So this was the main one, the one that was removed. This one was on a side street um, to some side parking here. Um, there's actually another curb cut over here, also off of the side, str side street. But the main way to access their main parking lot was via an alley in the back. And Janie said, that's not reasonable, that's not fair. We can't expect our, um, our patrons to come all the way around to the alley in the back. 
And the Division of Hearings and Appeals reviewed a lot of criteria that I'm sure you've talked about in other sessions about reasonableness of access. And they said, yeah, it is, it is reasonable. But that wasn't the end of the debate. Uh, the <laughs> landowners then went on to file an inverse condemnation claim. And I sometimes call this an indirect taking claim. Instead of saying, DOT, you're exercising your authority and affirmatively and purposely condemning part of our property, we're, we're saying you've done it indirectly. By this regulation, by exercising your powers under this permit revocation statute, you have in effect taken our property. And we actually had to have a trial in front of a judge in Milwaukee County. And ultimately the judge agreed with the Department of Transportation, I was representing the DOT at that time, and said, although your property is worth less, wor not worthless, but worth less, <laughs> although it is worth less in value, and although your business may be affected, that is not a taking. As John said, you have the, the incidental and consequential impacts to properties are not a taking. And so there was no taking here because the property was not deprived of all or substantially all beneficial use. Yeah, and this one is really hard to see, unfortunately. Um, and what it really shows is that here's our, here's our uh, Janey Investments property and um, the driveway is closed. And, and in fact, the property is still has functioning businesses, still has tenants, and the, t the users of those businesses go get in through the alley. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. There's a picture of the alleyway right there. So, you know, this is what the DHA said was, was reasonable and sufficient. And, um, you know, there's a lot of businesses that have access in a lot of different ways. Um, and the, the, the courts have said this is not a taking. Any questions before I hand it over? Okay. Okay, now we're going to talk about cases where it's a mixture. It's a little bit of police power and it's a little bit of taking and what happens. And uh, Dwayne and Nick will talk about this with two cases. Okay, so let me get in front of the mic here so that make sure everybody online can hear. Um, Dwayne and I are just going to go over two cases, give you some facts and some background and the outcome, and I think we're going to open it up to the, the roundtable discussion. So this is the Jantz case. Um, it's, it's a relatively old case. It went up to the Supreme Court of Wisconsin. Um, this is a bar and grill that was located in Germantown, Wisconsin. A lot of people from Wisconsin probably know where that is, but it's on the northwest side of Milwaukee. Um, it's now very developed. Uh, back in the 1970s, it was not nearly as much developed. This is uh, Interstate 41, uh, and this is Maple Road. And you can see in the before condition, uh, there was actually an intersection here that went through Interstate 41 before it was the interstate. Um, and this is the bar and grill right here. Although it's a little hard to see, you can kind of see the outline. Uh, Maple Road, this is, uh, I think this is going kind of northeast to cross here and you're and you've got access right there pretty close to the uh, to the future freeway and very good proximity to Maple Road and the freeway uh, the DOT came in uh, and they needed to widen this freeway and they took uh, almost four tenths of an acre along this portion of the property and that's a key fact that came out in this case in the Supreme Court is that that taking was all along here, not where they had their access, not where they had their proximity to Maple uh, Road. Uh, DOT also, in conjunction with that, straightened Maple Road. So you've got kind of an odd uh, situation here where the, it curves over, goes by the bar and grill, crosses, and, and goes up. Also, in conjunction with that, they changed the grade. So you had three different uh, occurrences, whether you consider them part of a whole or separate acts. This is what the Supreme Court got to. You've got the fee taking to widen I-41. You've got the relocation of Maple Road and then the change in grade. Um, so after, here you can see it's, it's very much improved. You've got still that location of the private property here, the widened freeway, and then uh, Maple Road coming up and over the freeway there. Uh, and here is the, the relocated access. So they still had access off of Maple Road. It's removed a little bit. 
um, from where the freeway is here, but the taking was only up here. Uh, the property owner uh, filed suit, actually appealed the award of compensation for the four-tenths of an acre. Uh, and their claim involved the fact that uh, now, in the after condition, their business was hurt. They didn't have the type of proximity where, uh, you know, you're driving down Maple Road or, and, you, and you can go right in or you go right by the property. Uh, the access is removed. Uh, and there's also a change in grade. Uh, so they made those uh, uh, three claims. Uh, the trial court um, allowed all evidence related to the, the fee taking, but excluded all evidence related to the change in grade and related to the um, relocation and the proximity of the road. Uh, the, the reasoning of the trial court in that case was that they were separate acts and they were non compensable acts. Um, the Supreme Court took this up, and this is again back in the 70s, uh, and sustained the trial court. Um, mostly relying on the trial court's findings of fact that this was indeed a separate and distinct act. Uh, and the trial, and the, although the Supreme Court decision is relatively short, it focuses on the fact that the fee taking did not cause the change in proximity and uh, the change in grade. Um, and we see some of that type of rationale now popping up in, in more recent case law. 118th Street talked a lot about causation. Uh, there was a recent case that it uh, doesn't have a published decision, but it's North Mayfair, uh, where there was also this type of interrelated acts where the court had to split them up or uh, discuss whether they're part of an integrated whole. Um, in this case, this, uh, the Supreme Court agreed with the trial court that it is separate and distinct and they were non-compensable. Uh, one of the interesting things that didn't come up, and I think probably the property owner, uh, this was before a lot of case law on reasonable access, but the property owner probably would have lost the argument anyways, but as to whether this is reasonable access, obviously now you're much further removed from the property, but that did not well, get brought up in the case. Yeah, actually, one of the things, if you notice in the, in the old picture, the road bent in order to come at closer to a 90 degree angle with the old expressway. When they put the free, when they turned it to freeway and they straightened it out, they used that stub that you see is old Maple Road. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're they so the minute they get on that stub, they're on the they're on the highway. So their access point to the highway actually doesn't change. It's just that there's more. It's more circuitous for them to get to Maple Road to to the main part of Maple Road, and it's also more circuitous for them to reach Highway 41 because of course now there's an overpass with no entrance and exit. Yeah, and the security argument is what they made. Uh, it's really a, I almost call this a proximity case, a lot like 118th Street, where you've essentially removed the, f the, the good frontage that you had. Um, you know, a bar and grill might be less important to have frontage than maybe, you know, some drive-by businesses. But uh, in this case, no compensation, separate and distinct acts. And that becomes key in the case law, which, as w you'll probably hear through the panel, is very confusing and there isn't very settled on when do you draw that line uh, as to when, it, when is an act separate and distinct. As we know, the DOT came through and did this all part as a bigger whole project, but how do you draw the line there? Right. There was also a claim for loss of visibility of the business here. And I don't know if any of you in your states deal with loss of visibility damages, but our Supreme Court said you don't get anything for that. And in fact, we just had a case involving a billboard on the South Beltline here in Madison where the, the Supreme Court reaffirmed that that point, you don't get compensation for loss of visibility. I don't know if there are any questions on this case specifically, otherwise we'll go on to Hoffer and then we can kind of open it up. Go ahead. This case, and, and maybe others too, but just to talk about, you know, pass by versus destination type of clientele. I mean, does that factor in? And that's not this was, but. Yeah, to repeat the question, you make a good point about a, a key fact that will often come up in an analysis and an argument that is made as to whether there's reasonable or unreasonable access in the after condition. And there are different types of businesses. There's a business where, you know, maybe an attorney's office where you know you need to get there and you're going to get there. That's, that's this destination business. Whereas there's the drive-by business, you know, the McDonald's, the, you know, something that you're going to drive by and you're going to say, hey, I want to stop there. I'm hungry. Um, I think that that plays a significant role in uh, your making your arguments for whether there's reasonable access in the after condition. Uh, that's something that an administrative law judge might look at. It's certainly something that a court would look at. Uh, we've always taken the position, I think there's good case law that says a jury determines whether there's reasonable access in the after condition. Courts have been mixed on this. You saw the J&E case, which didn't go to a jury. Um, administrative law, revocation of permits, don't go to a jury. Um, but you have something like a gas station, and in order for that 
highest and best use, they need certain access that's a lot different than a dentist's office or an attorney's office. So it definitely plays into the analysis, but it's again, you know, a case-by-case -case analysis as to, to what, and, and Duane has yeah, some comment on that. And, and my thought on that is really what you're talking about when you're talking about the destination um, versus uh, the other type of high-intensity retail uh, is that what you're really getting at is value there, okay? In other words, what would be the loss of value if it were compensable? And what this case is telling you is it's not compensable, so we don't really need to get there. Now, what Nick is talking about with regard to the reasonableness of access and that consideration, uh, attorneys have disagreement over when that comes into play. My argument certainly is, is if we're talking about the police power, we don't get to the reasonableness of the access. All that we get to is whether or not the change is due to the police power. If it's due to the police power, then you are not entitled to compensation, regardless of its reasonableness, unless it deprives you of all or substantially all beneficial use. So again, I think yours is getting more into the value, and again, Nick would have a disagreement with me, I think, with regard to whether or not reasonableness comes into play. But yeah, and that's really where we need clarification in the law. I mean, there's a case national auto that says, if, if the access is, is unreasonable in the after condition, you have a taking and you have something that's compensable. There's other law that says uh, the opposite. So right now we, we are in a position where this is going to be litigated in trial courts and hopefully we get some clarification from the Supreme Court. So I'll, I'll let you get to Hoffer. I think we're a little behind, but if there are any questions, I think we can address them afterwards. <laughs> so Nick represented to you that there is a um, lack of clarification with regard to what's separate and what's distinct. I represent to the court that I know exactly what is separate and what is distinct. <laughs> the lack of clarification is on the court's part. I'm frequently told I'm wrong. So the case that I'm going to get to is uh, Hoffer Properties. Which one is it? The, the one in the front. Okay. And Hoffer Properties involves a nine acre parcel of bar in my shaky hand right up there, okay? And it is on a controlled access highway. You guys have controlled access highways where you're from? Wisconsin we do, right? And controlled access highways are special types of highways. Governments are only entitled to, at least in Wisconsin, designate a certain number of miles. Once they make that designation, and they have to go through a laborious process to make the designation, but once they do that, they have um, more power, more ability to control access on it. Mr. Hoffer owned this nine acre parcel. He's got a house there. He's got some other things going on. He had residential and commercial applications going on the property. Um, prior to the project, you can see that he has an access point there, an access point there, two direct access points onto the highway. All of my appraisers in the room know what? Direct access to commercial is where it's at, right? So all you engineers come in here, you mess up the access to a commercial property, you cause these big losses in value. Now we got big lawsuits that we have to deal with. What happened here is in 2002, which is before the project, as I said, this was designated controlled access highway. Nevertheless, regardless of the um, designation, the two access points remained up until the DOT's project in 2008. What happened in 2008 is the DOT decided it was gonna relocate this road, which is another highway and connect it with this highway. Well, once they do that, what do you engineers know? You don't wanna have all these access points right real close to that roundabout, right? So we have to come in, we have to go through, we have to eliminate certain access points. Who is the unfortunate beneficiary of that? These access points, they go away. Mr. Hoffer's access points go away and he lost all direct access. Now you've heard people talk about police power and you heard people talk about regulation and restriction, right? Well. What um, Mr. Hoffer does is he says, look, you didn't regulate my access. You didn't restrict my access. You eliminated my access. I no longer have direct access. And the DOT says, oh, well, we took your direct access off here, but you still have access to the highway. We acquired some property from you back here, and we built this road that leads you right out to here, okay? And Hoffer says, you can't eliminate my access. You can only regulate or restrict. Supreme Court says that's not true under the controlled access statute in Wisconsin. And I would suggest that likely in your jurisdiction you have something similar. It says that the DOT may regulate and restrict access as it deems necessary and desirable. The court says that's very broad. That includes the right to eliminate it. We don't get to whether or not this is a high intensity commercial. We don't get to the fact of whether or not it is a 
uh, destination, uh, commercial, you don't get access. We're not even going to look at the reasonableness of it. If you have any access at all, alternate access, even if it be circuitous, you don't get compensation for that access change. Now, the Hoffer also made an argument that, well, since you took some of my property here and did this all at the same time, it's all part of this inseparable whole. And we get back to this Jantz case that uh, Nick talked about. And they said, well, look, you know, this all happened at one time. This is all one project. You did this and you took my property back here to create this uh, alternate access to me. This is all part of the separable whole, inseparable whole. Give me compensation for it. Again, the Supreme Court disagreed. Supreme Court said, look, your access points are up here. The taking is back here. Okay, we got proximity differences to it. And they said, this is easily separate and distinct from what they've done up here. Therefore, you're not entitled to compensation. Now, I don't know whether or not the other panelists, what they would think if we were on a controlled access highway, folks. And let's say that we didn't have the frontage road in the rear, but we had the frontage road right here where those access points were. Let's say that we took some of the property to build that uh, frontage road, but yet we still close these access points on this controlled access highway. John, is that compensable? Well, that's essentially what happened in National Auto Truck Stops. And um, it, I would advise my guys, if you do that, you're probably gonna wind up, you're, you're gonna wind up in a very confusing situation for a jury. I can't promise you I'm gonna be able to keep you from paying for that. Um, was, so you, was National Auto controlled access though? I don't uh, believe that it was. I don't, I don't remember it, whether it, it was or wasn't. It was supposed to be, but they forgot to move it when they changed yeah. the roadway. So and that was one of the distinguishing <laughs> factors I remember in right. National Auto. But yeah, the controlled access highway is a, a process that after a public hearing uh, and this, the decision and findings, they're all recorded. So the property owners know they're on a controlled access highway. It's right. not something hidden from them. It comes as no surprise. And over the years, the regions frequently remind them, say, you know, one day we'll come along here and take, it, take this away from you because this is just, you're on a controlled access. You don't have any right here. Remember that when you're going to develop. Right. Sarah, did you have something? I was, I was actually going to say what Jim said, that, that if you, the question is, how do you know if a highway is controlled access? The main way is you get title work for the property that's being impacted. These are all recorded in the Register of Deeds. And then also the DOT maintains uh, some maps and databases, which are a good starting point. So if you're an engineer, member of the public, or a property owner, and you want to know, uh, is this uh, highway controlled access such that the department could come along and severely restrict the access at any time, um, number one, go to the Register of Deeds, and number two, consult the resources that DOT has in our state that show you whether a highway is controlled access or not. And I think that one of the important takeaways here is, is what we want to try to do whether we're in Jantz, whether we're here, is we want to try for you engineers, for you planners, to help us make things clear that we're doing this here for this reason and we're doing this here for the other reason. Now, the court may not agree with me when I come up there and I say, Mike Roach told me we did this here and we did this over here, okay? But it gives me something to argue. So I think that's gonna be one of the important takeaways is trying to make this uh, clear uh, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and under what power you're doing it. Right. So, and, and yeah, from my perspective, you know, my preference is if we're going to go out and close driveways, you know, under the police power, if you do that before your project, it's going to be real clear. They'll be closed when you come to do your real estate taking, and you won't probably won't have that issue. Uh, if you wait and do it all at once and you take a strip especially when you're doing a strip take where those entrances are you're looking at headaches in in court you're yeah. probably going to wind up paying damages god forbid if you take access rights too when you right. take that strip right. right so anybody have any questions yes sir Oh, we did. The question was uh, whether or not the DOT compensated him for the taking on the south side. And the answer to that is the DOT did compensate him. The parties did not disagree. I think he got 90 grand for that. Uh, the parties didn't disagree that that was adequate compensation for that. The dispute really arose over whether or not he was entitled to the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he sought due to the access change. 
Yes, ma'am. How would you determine what is going to be a typical stroke highway? Uh, a con the question was, how do you determine what's going to be a controlled access highway? And Mike Roach is the fellow who would be able to answer that. There's, a, like I said, a process that needs to go through um, with certain criteria. So at the DOT in Wisconsin, our planning department decides where that 1,500 miles that the legislation's allowed us to put this controlled access highway. Um, so some of our highways have six miles, some might have 26 miles, and we keep track of those 1,500 miles. But they decide it's not always, like Sarah said, the most dangerous highways. I haven't quite put my arms around it because um, it, you would think it's the highest ADT. It's not that. It's I used to think it was most of our commuter highways where you need to push traffic along between two towns. People are working and you want less and less access um, or more planning, I should say. So the 8425 projects that we have are where you can force a property owner. We're not going to always take his driveways away, but if he's got a lot of frontage, we're gonna, we have this big muscle in our toolbox that allow him to say, what are you going to do with the rest of your frontage? You have to tell us what you're going to do. And so at Blue Mound Avenue in Milwaukee used to be cornfields, and now it's a very urban place. It's 8425, but it allowed us to have it functional. So um, that's a great question, but the planners are the ones that get yeah, together it, every year and decide where it, that is. And this has developed over the years. So uh, these are artifacts of history, too. And there is a different statute for the interstate and for freeways, which has different requirements and, in fact, requires certain things to be done, like frontage roads or compensation. So it you really have to look at the, the specific roadway too and what the history of it is. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. The property owner, Hoffer, when they were purchasing the, the uh, backage road, did Hoffer understand that the driveways were going at the same time that, that the $90,000 was paid? Yes, he did. It, it was all part of the plan to close all of this, to purchase this. It was all done at the same time. And under Wisconsin law, uh, the DOT is required to let him know what the acquisition is going to be, what the project is going to look like, to pay the compensation. Hoffer then appealed it, claiming that he didn't get uh, enough money and sought the damages associated and with this. I, I think there's an important thing to keep in mind here. If you look at the, at the award of damages to Hoffer, okay, I can't remember if there's an award or a deed, but the, the conveyance instrument did not include any access rights. Right. DOT did not pay for access rights here, and we didn't include any in our, in our taking documents. So that if, if we'd have said we are taking all your access rights, even though it was police controlled, we'd have had to pay it. Okay, if we, if we had said we're taking all the access as real estate, then he couldn't even come in and apply for a driveway permit, okay? With this situation today, let's suppose Hoffer decides he wants to put a subdivision in on his property instead of what he's got there. He can come back to DOT and say, hey, I'm going to put a subdivision in. I want to change this access. And our permitting folks will look at it all over again. He still has the right to come in and apply for, for authorization to put in a driveway. And we'll figure it out all over again. If we'd taken the access, he can't even come in and ask. Uh, one more, Jim, you got back there. Not that I'm aware. Uh, th the question was um, the individual in the before condition had a relatively short amount of driveway to maintain here. In the after condition, he has a larger amount of driveway to maintain is there ever any compensation for the snow removal and the answer to that is i don't know but the length of this is not his driveway this is the extension of this road um i don't know who's maintaining that sir um but i have seen that in cases um by certain appraisers so um go ahead Jim. just a little sidelight on that uh it who plows the snow is kind of up to a local government because 
you cannot use public funds for private purposes. You can't build a private driveway with, with public forces in, in Wisconsin. But the Supreme Court has never said that you can't plow snow. So a lot of times it depends on what's the local government's policy of how far they plow. Uh, is this one still live? Yep. Uh, in, in fairness, and give some balance, no, we don't do things correct all the time. <laughs> and sometimes it is painful. Uh, this Pewaukee mattress is a case uh, where uh, one of the fellow's partners here uh, represented the property owners and abstained a substantial increase in compensation. DOT acquired 0.18 acres in fee and 0.20 acres uh, in a temporary limited easement from approximately a four acre site. Uh, they changed direct access to access via a new back road. This is the property right here. The access was right there. Um, Advance it one slide. This is the after situation. Uh, this is the property here, no direct access. To get to that property, go here, and you go up here, you go here, and you go this round out, and then you're gonna go, you gotta go here, and then you go right over here. Uh, the compensation DOT offered was $139,200 for the uh, 0.1 acres in fee and 0.2 acres in temporary limited easement. Uh, jury came back with one million and uh, sixty-six thousand dollars. And the way the law works in Wisconsin, if, if you beat DOT by what is it, fifteen percent? Fifteen percent. You have to pay their attorneys' fees for this too. So, uh, all in all, it costs the state about one point five million. So, let's have the guys that won this case talk about it. So, if the you wrote the memo on why not to appeal it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, JJ, you want to go, go ahead and I'll, well, I'll, talk, we'll, I'll, we'll talk about the here. bad facts. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were the bad facts? <laughs> <laughs> well, you really want to know? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you guys can see how the, the access dramatically changed. And so that's one of the obviously the bad facts here. So you've got access that was directly on. And just so you know, this is, I believe at the bottom here is Capitol Drive. Uh, and this is a, a major, I forget the name of the road, a major cross I've street. Forgotten to. What, what is 64? So you're at a you're at a very ideal location for this property owner here. And now he now they come in and they tell him that all of you know, essentially you're trying to find this place and you don't know where to go into. And so I don't know if you had any more to use the mic. So you're trying to find this location here and when in the before condition you could turn in right at where the location is so you know you're, you're looking as you're driving and now you got to figure out a way to get there through various different turn movements around about and then in through the back door so you can see this is a, a dramatic change even more than j and e um, and you know it, it makes a big difference what trial court you're in and and who's making these decisions this was obviously out in waukesha county um and so the dot did lose a trial court but it did not get appealed did not make uh, good law or bad law, however you look at it. So we don't have a published case law here, but I think Jim really wanted to get across what the mistakes were that were made and what the DOT yeah. could do differently one to have avoided this. One of the bad facts is we left driveways right here close to the intersection. And you, well, why was it so important to take this one out? And at the time that was done, it wasn't, the, the, the north-south road there was a county highway. That was County Road J at that time. It, it's now State Highway 164 because we moved Highway 164. But at the time of the taking, that was a county highway, and the entrance was onto the county highway. So, yeah. So, so if, if, if the jury said, well, "Well, why is that so important?" And I'm not sure why we took the access by eminent domain. Well, and a key point here is this is not a controlled access highway. No, it's not. Uh, although Hoffer came well after this, it'd probably be a different, I'll let you get your seat back, Jim. It'd probably be a very different uh, situation here. And this was, this went to the jury. So the jury got to decide whether there was reasonable access or not. And let me put it to you that that is the real bad fact. You know, if, if anything went wrong for DOT, it wasn't, uh, you know, I mean, 
call me simple, but you know, the land changes a little bit. We've got driveway changes. I love access, but I think the real bad fact here is that they got a jury instruction in, uh, bad fact for DOT, they got a jury instruction in that did not include anything with the police power. So the judge, number one, um, allowed for a question to go to the jury that was pretty landowner favorable. And uh, in terms of mistakes cost, the bad fact number two is that you know the jury was persuaded. Um, when we talk about sort of good facts, bad facts, compensable, not compensable, we need to always put it back into that lens of eventually I'm gonna need to have an appraiser be able to defend this uh, if they go on the stand and not just say, hey, well, DOT told me it's reasonable access. I need to be able to say as an appraiser, um, one through eight, here are my factors, here are my considerations, and here's why I did it on this particular property. This is what I came up with. Um, that's something that you know the jury's not gonna wanna hear. DOT told me so. What I would also ask for in terms of defending you know, a, uh, an access case with that human element is really get, I guess, the um, uh, you know, powerful facts out there. You need to be able to talk uh, you know, throughout the way um, like you've, you've analyzed this. It, it really can't be an early step um, determination of reasonable access, not reasonable access and then you know, just letting it go. Um, you may need to have engineers come in later on during litigation, even though you've already had engineering look at it um, and make their determination. You, mean, you may need to have them come in, testify, and explain why are these considerations leading me to the, to the conclusion that we still have reasonable access. Um, so I think you know, we have the world's experts on access here, um, but that doesn't mean a lick in Waukesha County to a jury if we can't humanize it and if we can't apply it to the particular facts on the ground each time because it's going to go through that judge going to get a jury instruction and it's going to go to that jury another problem is apparently we could not find a permit that allowed the driveway in the first place and so we didn't have anything to look back to to see what the restrictions were in that permit if anything uh, we, we take the position that if there's no permit, then you don't have any, any access allowed. But that's kind of hard to argue when it's typical to issue permits. In this case, when it was a county road, make sure you go back to the county and see what, if they have a permit they've issued. I don't know if that was done or not, frankly. It's been a long time. Uh, that was a real question in, in our mind. Uh, do you remember, Sue? Uh, it, it, you know, and again, John had mentioned it was a county highway, so we didn't have the control of the documents, so we didn't have anything on the, on the permit for the driveway. Yeah, but, but did anybody go back and ask the county if there was a permit? I believe that they did. I know I, I didn't get involved yeah. in that yeah. part of it. So, yeah, I mean, if you were sitting down, if, 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 you were, if you're an access guy sitting down with me and asking, or a designer asking me about this today, I would be saying, look over here. Why, you know, in the before condition, people came down this road, turned right, and came to Pewaukee Mattress, okay? Now maybe this driveway is too close to the highway here. It's like Jim said, if you close these, it'll look better if you can close that one, okay? But you're gonna have to explain why you're treating this one differently. But why not bring this road through? Can you bring it through up here and connect in? Or up here, you know, now there's a new, and you can't see it here. Today, 20 years later, or 30 years later, there's a big development over here. This is a Costco now over here in this, in this quadrant. So, you know, they could have connected up over here and come through, in which case, I think I could have made the same arguments I made in that J&E case. Yeah, the access has changed, but big deal. You come up here and you go down the alley and you're in the parking lot and everybody's gonna reach it the same way. But just to get back to Jim's point and, and the difference between J&E in this case is J&E was a, a permit revocation. And although we didn't represent the, the property owners in that process, we took the circuit court case, if there is a permit revocation process, the, at least in our perspective, the property owner is at a significant disadvantage here because we have to go yep. through the, the, the division of hearings and appeals in front of an administrative law judge argue whether this is reasonable or unreasonable access. Um, the administrative law judge is typically uh, a lot less unfavorable to a property owner and is going to uh, listen a little bit more to the DOT and the DOT's right. engineers then you already have 
a determination, although it's by an administrative law judge, as to whether the access is reasonable or not, and you're fighting an uphill battle. In this case, we didn't have that permit revocation process. We're right in circuit court. We got the judge to what we think is, is the correct law and out of uh, national auto to say that the determination of whether it's reasonable or not should go to the jury, the finder of fact. Uh, and the jury in this case was persuaded, and I think a lot of people would be just by this picture right here. So. Right. So, so what, what Sue just explained, and for those of you who couldn't hear and those in the video, is that there actually were plans to develop this parcel. The, the, the municipality had plans on what they expected there. They did not expect a high intensity use like a McDonald's on that corner. And the appraisers came in and said, well, the highest and best use here is McDonald's, and that's what you ought to pay them for losing here. And, uh, and gosh, you can't put a McDonald's on a, on a roundabout like this. And of course, because they didn't build the roads that they planned for development yet, none of that could have been con was, was considered by the it's jury all either. Built today. It's all built today. Throughout the today, it's all built as a road that goes north and connects. Right. It all, yeah. All so she says it all connects up today. Yeah. yeah. One, one of the other reasons that it was not appealed is jury instructions are kind of a discretionary function of the court, and it's hard to get them overturned. And the judge would not allow the instruction that DOT and the jury could could properly consider the safety reasons for closing that access. Couldn't get it in, it was just whether it was reasonable. And what the trial attorney did was he took a video partially at night on how you get back to that parcel with no signs, and, uh, dark, no street lights. It was, it was pretty devastating. But I mean, I guess that speaks to developing those facts um, and being creative when you develop those facts. That yeah, can work. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. hey I'll, I'll creativity versus. Hey, hey, DOT can be creative too. If they had the same person driving down that road, I take a timer in my left hand and I'm showing you know me driving and I'm seeing that it takes 30 seconds now to get you know around this circuitous yeah. way, versus it took 20 in the before. Right. That's and, that's what I want to play up. You know. Right. Um, and. You know, we did the exact same thing in the reverse in that JNE case that, that Sarah brought up. Um, I had I, one of the slides I put up at, at the trial before the administrative law judge was a, a picture of Highway 83, 20 miles from the subject site. And I asked the, the, the expert who was saying this, the access was so terrible, can you tell me about this site? And he said, I, I don't know what that is. And I read off the address of his property and said, isn't this such and such street, such and such address, Highway 83. And he goes, oh my goodness, that's my office. And then I pointed out, and then I made him show how he would get from Highway 83 in front of his office to his office, and he had to draw a line going all the way around, you know, doing a much worse trip than, they, than, the, than the people in J&E had to do. And that kind of, and that, that was his office, you know. Well, how unreasonable is it to go around the block to get in there? And uh, so, you know, that works both ways, and, right. and both sides Absolutely. can use that and, and really should because yeah. it goes to whether it's reasonable. I think when you talk about these security, security cases, you know, years ago, every gas station had lots of entrances, sometimes continuous pavement between the roadway and the, and the gas station. Today, we're seeing much less of that. I think, it, you know, most times when you get off at an access road, you're going down some kind of an, uh, you're using some kind of an access road to get into properties. And I think juries are gonna see that. I think juries are gonna think that's more and more reasonable over time. To add to that really briefly, uh, Pat Hawley was my star witness in the j &E Investments case when we went to court on the takings issue. And we had him do exactly that. We had him or others in his office take a, a clock, uh, take a watch and, and time the different routes and what it really took and give us some uh, basis for comparison and good evidence to, to go into court. So that's a role for you engineers and planners out there. 
That's if you don't miss the, the entrance and have to go around. Yeah. <laughs> you know where you're going. So. Over there. So, uh, do you want to repeat the, that? The, the, repeat, the question was, how often do the attorneys get involved early on with designers and the planners and the engineers and the access people? Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it, we have asked at least this, though. When you have a big project, get all your fee appraisers and your, your state appraisers together and decide exactly how you're going to go out <laughs> making decisions on what is reasonable access remaining. Yeah, and, and uh, let me follow up on that. Mike Roach, God love him, has put together training materials for our agency so that hopefully all our designers will eventually have access control training. And what we try to do, you know, on big projects, we have attorneys that will be sitting down with folks and looking at them. And the, one of the things in the training is helping people recognize, hey, this is where you know we've got a problem here where we better talk to a, an attorney and get some advice and um and i would say the same thing to you when you've got a goofy situation like this talk to your lawyers because they'll help you sort out how to do it and there may be ways where you can save yourselves a lot of money and a lot of headaches and, I, I just, and not only not only financial headaches but the political headaches as well right because of course we all know that you know if you're working in government um you won't be happy when that legislator comes to see you either. Yeah, the, qu the, qu the question I would have asked is why didn't they just move the road this way rather than closing? Why did it have to be closed here? Why didn't, why did they take the property over on this side? It's actually too close for an intersection to the proximity of that intersection. Yeah, it is now, but yeah the intersection is huge now. Yeah. problem was they had access points really close down below yeah yeah I think that's what's another reason it wasn't appealed is we we had another case which we thought would we had better facts would make better law which was the national auto truck case uh, and that that was a determination by the court that says no the jury gets to consider where whether the remaining uh, access is reasonable. That's a jury question. And in that case, we didn't quite get the decision from the Supreme Court we wanted, but on remand, the trial was bifurcated where the jury had to first determine whether the remaining access was reasonable. And the jury said yes, and the person ended up with no compensation anyway. But it is now a jury question. Pretty well established. Uh, going to go on to another situation which uh, John's going to talk about uh, what happens when you put out a highway on a new location what, what do you look for then uh, as to access oh this is the Wisconsin town, townhouse builders case and this is an old case for Madison but I, I, I think this is, this case is important because it involves the difference between you know, when I look at this case, it's the first case in Wisconsin that I think really distinguishes between taking an, an easement for a highway and buying fee simple title to land. In Wisconsin, in the you know, for for under the common law in Wisconsin, we used to the the state and the counties and and uh, the municipalities when they bought highways almost always bought an easement, a highway easement, okay? And if, you, if all you have is an easement, then the, 
the, the, the, you're the dominant estate, but the servient estate, that re, the, the, the person who holds the land underneath the easement, the remaining interest in the land, has a right to use the, the easement in a manner not inconsistent with the dominant estate holder. So in our early cases in Wisconsin, it made absolute sense for the court to say, well, of course, the abutting owner who owns the land underneath the highway where that highway easement is has a right to enter that easement and use it to travel. Okay, so we wound up with cases that said you have a right of access to the highway. And it made absolute sense because it was an easement. Of course they had a right to get on that highway and use it. In Wisconsin townhouse builders, what happened is the city of Madison, th this is a big parcel of land that was going to be developed out here. Okay, and before these houses are built, the city of Madison came in and bought two acres of land in fee. Okay? And the city of Madison doesn't have a controlled access statute like the state does, but it's a municipal corporation. And in Wisconsin, we have this thing called home rule. Municipalities have all sorts of powers um, as to, to run their own business, to, to, to do their own thing. And, they, and so the city of Madison, when they bought this land, said, we're not going to give any access rights to this road when we build this new road. So they bought two acres in fee. These adjoining owner, this adjoining property has no right of access that, that's acquired with that. They don't have an easement interest anymore. They don't have a serving to state interest to get onto this highway. They bought fee simple title. And in their deed, they said, no rights of access are going to accrue to the abutting owners. Okay. They didn't take access. They said, we're not going to give you any access from this highway. And the court considered, and the court, so the court was, these people sued and said, hey, you've taken, we have a right to access any highway we abut, and city of Madison, you've taken that from us. And the Supreme Court looked at it and said, wait a minute, there was no highway there to start with. You didn't have a right to enter any highway when this thing started because there was no highway. So the city hasn't taken anything from you. They just didn't give you anything. They don't have to give you anything. There's no taking here. And they, and, and so thus, there's no taking and no compensation in this situation. Um, and they, yeah, that's what it looks like today. No entrances directly onto Aberg Avenue. This is on the east side of Madison. If if anyone's interested. Uh, uh, just a, it, it was in about 1945, I think, when the state uh, no longer decided it was gonna buy property and easement. So what did they do over the years? Sure, when they bought new property, they'd buy it in fee. But most highway improvement projects are your widening. So if you're taking a, you know, a six or 10 foot strip, they would describe the property they were taking back to the center line of the highway. So in effect, they were perfecting the whole property to fee ownership because it was already subject to a highway easement. So they weren't paying anything extra for it. They were just paying for really the value of the 10 foot strip or the six foot strip. So that, that's, that is a very, very important distinction. And when you read the early case laws in Wisconsin, you can't figure out, well, why do they keep saying that people have this right of access? And then John, all of a sudden, the light bulb went off and all of my mind, well, it's because these were all easements back then. So there's a whole bunch of old cases that say people have a right of access to the highway. Just no qualification. Right, and, and I think in situations where we've bought those strips of fee along, you know, outside of where we had an easement, the court has, and unless we say we're taking access, the court hasn't implied a taking of access. So um, I, I would, the conversion of, a, of an old easement highway to a, a, a fee highway doesn't necessarily take all the access, unless you say it does, I think, in Wisconsin. Can I highlight one thing that may be different in other jurisdictions than here? Under Wisconsin law, there is no such thing apart from other types of takings, there's no such thing as the taking of a right of access. You can buy it, you can affect it through all of the different things we've talked about here today, but there is no such thing, the closure of a driveway by itself 
is not a taking of the right of access. That may be different in other jurisdictions. There are other jurisdictions where the closure of a driveway or the removal of, of direct access to a highway, there's case law on it that says that is a taking for which compensation is required. Currently, that is not the, the state of law in Wisconsin. And, and I've had a few different cases with landowners council where we've sparred over that issue and the exact nature of the right of, of, uh, of access and whether, whether there is such a thing as a right of, a taking of the right of access. And that issue was front and center in J&E where, where the department didn't exercise its condemnation powers to take that access, but did it through a police power separately. And they argued that you've taken our access. And we said there is no case law in Wisconsin that says the mere closure of a driveway is the taking of the right of access. But that may be different in other jurisdictions. And, and we would take that position as well because Right, if we close the driveway, that doesn't mean we might not consider opening a driveway again, perhaps for different use, um, perhaps for a new development. Um, if it's police power, the story's not over. Um, if we say we are taking all the access from a property though, it would be listed in the, in the deed, and then by God, we're gonna pay for it. And um, if that renders the land, you know, completely, you know, if, I mean, we, we sometimes we, render properties completely useless and we wind up having to, to offer to buy the parcel as a remnant parcel because you know, it's got virtually no value, it's, it's un inaccessible. And that, that happens, yeah. um, especially when you're putting the roads on new alignments and things. And with, with regard to whether closing a driveway is a taking or not, as Sarah explained, remember that 31 of the states have something in addition to takings in their constitutions they insert something along the lines of damages or other effects that have to be compensated. So that may change the situation entirely. But basically under the U.S. Constitution, applies to all of us, this is what happens. Right, in, in the damages states, one of the things the courts look at typically is that, um, for example, let's suppose that you've got a developer that's going to come in and wants to develop a parcel and you want to you want to control his access and take all his access, but maybe one spot as part of that development. The states will generally allow you to do to do that in order, to, as long as all you're affecting with your taking is his property. But if, for example, we had a two-lane highway and we wanted to make it a four-lane expressway, and we knew that, and we were going to come through and buy the land for that four lane expressway to serve the general public at large. And just because this developer came to us at the wrong time, we said, hey, we want you to donate, you know, 150 feet of land here so we can build an expressway. At that point in these damages states, they're gonna say, hey, that's not for development of that property. It's not particular to that property. And those damages don't, re that, that's not police power activity anymore. We're gonna make you pay for that. So California, for example, would make the state pay for uh, pay for the 150 feet in, in that example. Okay, what did we? What do you have to take away from this discussion? And we can uh, all talk about this. Anybody can ask questions about it. Uh, one thing from the outset, I'd say check the title. Are you talking about ownership and fee, or do you just have an easement there? What, what is the nature of that access? Find the permit. Maybe there was a county permit, maybe not. Uh, but you, you need to look at the preceding jurisdiction to see how that driveway got there in the first place. You need to know if there's a presumption in your state. If you can't show a permit, you don't have any right of access. Or if you don't have, you can't show a permit, then well, you have a right of per there by the fact that you're there. Um, and as John just explained, if you acquire access by deed or award and you're not on new location, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it because you, you, our court has said, if you say you're taking all rights to future, present or future access, that means they don't even have the authority, uh, the right to ask for a permit. If they ask for a permit and it's denied, you just say you can't even appeal it because you don't have a property right. We bought that access. You can't even ask for a permit. So, and I'll throw another one on there. If you're issuing permits, check the real estate records. I can't tell you how 
fun it is to have somebody come in and say, hey, we've got this driveway that we don't like here. Uh, we issued a permit for it uh, two years ago and we've decided we don't like it. And you look at the real estate records and oh, by the way, we bought all rights of access to that property. They couldn't even apply for a permit. And now we've issued one and you have to undo that permit taking process and say, oh, gee, court, uh, we messed up. It was issued in error and you try to re and you revoke it. And Jim, that's not any fun either. Jim, can you talk about how someone goes about finding the permit? Where are these things found? Yeah, unfortunately, they're not recorded. Yeah, that would be very, very helpful if you could go to the property and, and find the recording. If Right. Yeah, but uh, yeah, well, I'm saying recorded by DOT in some sort of database that you can search. Yeah. No, in fact, we put in the permits that they are not transferable. Because if, they're, if your permit says that they're transferable in Wisconsin to the next property owner, that means there's a right of, there's a property right there. And there's a case involving Marathon County that dealt with the utility X, utility, transferable utility permit. So when they made them move their poles, they made them pay for moving it. What in our case. Uh, Let me try some other takeaways. Uh, indirect access is still access if it's reasonable. That's, if you get to that point, you're going to get to a jury. If they ask for a jury, you really don't know how that's going to come out. Uh, so you, you ought to have a, some sort of uniform, as best you can, way of determining what's reasonable or not. And we do have experts that testify to that. Uh, JJ's father is an appraiser. JJ's had this appraisal experience. He's dealt with uh, reasonableness. Pat Holly has. I think Pat made a presentation, which I wasn't able to hear yesterday, of how you determine what's reasonable. But look, make up your minds of exactly how, you, how you're going to make that determination. Try to be at least consistent on it. Right. And there again, if you, if, you're, if you get to the point where you're trying to figure that out, you should be talking to your lawyers. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, it's an, there's engineering judgment there, but your lawyers will give you a much better read of what a jury's going to read into it than, uh, than your engineers will. Yeah. And, you know, if you've got a very popular project, you probably have a very popular jury. But if you have a very unpopular project for some reason or another, you've got, you've got to you actually have that in the back of your mind. Uh, how, what safety considerations did you have in making the decision to close that access? You know, have somebody have some record of why. I know that Mike looks at these things very carefully uh, and comes down to the attorney's office, DOT, and says, boy, this one's kind of strange. Uh, what are we going to do about this? So there, there is a record of what went into making that decision on, on the, the cases which are particularly difficult. Well, I, I, and I would say, you know, we have two papers out here, two of these uh, posters out here that are terrific on these issues. I talked to the presenter, to both presenters. One is the, the, the one on safety, right, about crashes in Iowa, which is terrific. It's exactly the kind of data that we would use on the safety issue. And there's another one down here where they use traffic cameras to point out mobility issues caused by a driveway entrance. And in fact, they wound up putting in a right turn lane and showing how that reduced, you know, it, 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 it increased the, the uh, commute time by six seconds for each car in that corridor, taking out the, you know, by putting in a right turn lane so the people didn't have to slow down for the driveway entrance. I use, you know, I always emphasize mobility and economics when I'm arguing these things before an administrative law judge, um, as well as safety, because you know sometimes you don't have crashes at the driveway. In G&E, it was terrific. We had all these crashes right in front, but we don't we don't always we don't always get that. Funny use of and, the word terrific. <laughs> and and in, in in mobility, well, it's it's terrific from the lawyer standpoint of trying to get rid of the driveway. It's terrific. Not not so good for the crash victims. Um, but the, uh, you know, the mobility and the economic issues are important as well. And if you want your economy to develop, if you want commerce, you know, we always point out the purpose of our state system 
is to get commerce moving across the state. It's not to get somebody into their house. And you know, it's not a local street that's designed for residential cars backing out onto it and going forward. So I always emphasize that commercial part and that mobility issue um, as well. And I think if you can quantify that uh, the way the folks out here have, that will help you in your, in your case. Yeah, to add to that, let's not lose sight of why we're designing roads and why we're managing access. And it is to move people, but it also is, is to have safe roads. And uh, so much of what we've talked about in this presentation is money. And how much is it going to cost you? And how do we reduce the risk of having to pay for X and Y? But at the end of the day, we all want safe roads. We all want businesses to function in our communities. And ultimately, those are decisions that have to be left, in my view, to the engineers and the planners. But we're doing everybody a service if we can get on the same page and understand when it's going to cost us a lot. Because as engineers know, everything you guys do, there's a cost-benefit analysis that has to be done for every decision you make. And the problem is when you think you're doing something simple that isn't going to cost the project a lot, and it actually explodes and blows your project budget. So you guys have to keep remembering and coming back to those safety considerations. And we have to do a good job of communicating with you about where your financial risk is. And then the planners and engineers have to decide what course to take. Yeah, it, you need to, I mean, clearly sometimes, and sometimes often, depending upon uh, who you happen to draw as your attorney, you're going to have to provide more information than usual that maybe that more seasoned attorney already knows. So don't forget that. If you, if you have a corridor planning process uh, where over the years for this particular highway from way from this point, way to this point, this is a designated corridor which we call tier one for controlling access. That is a, an important piece of information that the attorney ought to know about. And a new attorney, maybe even some of the old attorneys don't know that. Why is this highway different than others? Not just because it's controlled access, but because of the nature of the travel on the highway and the development that's expected on that. Looking to the future, we have a corridor plan. And it is not only that, it is a tier one corridor plan for closing access points. Yes, Phil. Well, the, yeah, that's your. So repeat your, the question, your, Yeah, the, the question. No, the the question is when does tort law affect eminent domain valuation under the Fifth no, Amendment? But, but let me let me go further, Phil. Phil wanted to know well, why why doesn't the property owner held liable for creating uh, crashes? Well, because uh, somebody's got to get hurt and then sue the property owner. That's the well, state. And the other thing is, the property owner in Wisconsin can't just go out and build a driveway. In Wisconsin, we have a law that says you can't dig in the highway or change the highway unless you get a permit. So they get that permit from who? Us. So if we've, you know, they don't have that driveway unless we've given them permission or unless they've built it illegally. And, and Jim, can I just chime in for a minute? Phil, I think I understand your question a little bit differently. What you're basically saying is, is look, we're doing something for the public good. Why do we have to pay somebody to accomplish that? And, and you don't have to. Right. Uh, uh, right. Okay. Okay, and, and I just want to make one point clear. We're talking about reasonableness of access. We're talking about all these things. One of these underlying themes here is, look, we want to make these roadways safer. It's about how do we go about doing it. If you can take advantage of the police power to do it, Phil, you've got a driveway that's causing all kinds of accidents. Let's figure out how we're going to close that driveway, but let's figure out how we can do it without having to unnecessarily compensate the landowner. Let's go through the police power process. 
jury never sees reasonableness of access if it's a police power act and if we keep it separate and distinct yeah. and that's one of the big takeaways i think that we need to have here is is you guys need to design highways how you need to design highways but what's important here is what steps do you take to do that and consult with your lawyer about ways that you can accomplish that without um, having to unnecessarily pay compensation yeah and and that really goes to number seven which is you know my advice is to, 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 to my staff is separate this police power actions and do it first when we talked about that J&E case that's what we did we knew there was a project coming through the zoo interchange project is well at that time we expected to improve the north leg of the zoo interchange um, and so we, we knew we were gonna have to deal with those driveways as part of that project we went out and used the police power ahead of the project and got those driveways removed by revoking the permits and then taking out the taking out the entrances didn't have to pay a penny uh, to get back to Phil's question the statute in Wisconsin says when when the DOT affects an existing driveway they have to restore it so we actually restore the part that's on our right away well no because part of the driveway is always on the, the highway property and we have done that the statute says from that point on the property owner is responsible for maintaining that driveway so there is an exposure on maintenance if that had anything to do with the crash and and to let you know that property owners do have responsibilities suppose you have an intersection of a county road and the town road and the county decides we don't like that town road uh, being an uncontrolled access there we're going to we're going to put up a stop sign there so that the town road has to stop before they enter the county road and over the years the property owner which is uh, on the town highway has a bush or something that starts growing over that top stop sign and blocks it and then lo and behold one day somebody blows through there because they don't they don't see the stop sign and they hit somebody on the county road and there's deaths and damages and teeth hair all over the highway and all that problem uh, who's responsible who's responsible for cleaning off that tree so it's not that's a bush that's not blocking the the stop sign the stop signs the county asked them to put the stop sign there it's the town road it's the property owners bush who's responsible and the Wisconsin support in Wisconsin says yeah it's your all of your responsibility so you could sue every one of those entities and that's what the court decided uh, my advice to the property owner is go out there and cut your bush because uh, you don't want to get involved in that case let the let the, let the, the town and the county fight that that accident case that crash case um, number eight takeaway uh, do a post-mortem when something goes absolutely haywire either because you've got a dangerous intersection uh, you have lost a court case yeah you have a heck of a lot of people saying that you, you need to back off from this policy or this designation in this area find out why just sit down with everybody that's involved and just decide well where where did we go wrong or what should we do in the future and as, as john said cripes don't waste the resources you have people deal with permits and appeals all the time the, the resources are there they can give you a prediction of what's going to happen okay how about a checklist uh, I think uh, Drew suggested a, a, ch a checklist this is kind of a, a checklist that, that we've to put, kind of put together it's not perfect but you know if you do have a checklist maybe your newer people will, will know where to look and what to do do they have access in the first place we we often find that people are driving onto the highway where there's no curb there's no access there there's no permit for that access uh, so why are you talking about taking their access 
and in, with, in cities this happens all the time. Uh, okay, what is the nature of that access? Is it a right? Is it in the title? Is it a highway acquired in fee or easement? You know, was it previously acquired for highway purposes? Um, yeah, my, my, my favorite, and I've run into this, we, we have a taking, a, a conveyance that says we're taking all access, and you look back and 25 years ago, somebody already bought all the access on another highway deed. There's no need to be buying access because we already own it, and there they put it in the deed. Thank you guys, that made my life a lot easier. <laughs> here's, here's another situation, and this is more for folks with working with the local governments. State has this controlled access highway law. The counties in Wisconsin have a similar law. They, they have the authority to designate controlled access county highways. And over the years, sometimes, we jurisdictionally transfer our highways to the county. And the county will, will come along and, and not realize that we've already controlled this highway under the same exact worded authority the county uses. And the county goes out there and buys property and buys the access. It makes it just makes no sense, and I've seen the city of Madison do that. And here, when we change the limits of these controlled access highways, it, it, I, I can't emphasize more that you, you need to do your homework. And we talked about recorded easement. Oh, if if you're there are statutes that say if, you, if you're dividing up a parcel that has ex access and after the parcel, the abutting parcel is divided, uh, you want another access point for this new property owner because otherwise they don't have access. There are statutes in Wisconsin that says when you divide a parcel like that, you have to provide an easement to the existing access point. You can't just demand a new, new driveway permit. Well, and, right, under the common law, you'll get if you sell, if somebody sells a parcel without access, the grant, the, the grantor is going to be giving a, a, an easement of necessity across his remaining land so that that parcel without access can get out. So we've had more than one case where a landowner's come to us and said, hey, I just bought this property from my neighbor and uh, I want a driveway now. And we'll say, no, you're not gonna get a driveway. This is controlled access highway. And he's, but how do I get onto my property? And we say, ask the guy who sold you the land. He's got to give you a way to get onto your property, and we make them go across. And there's an, you know, the law establishes an easement of necess necessity across that neighbor's land. And that should be the case in all your states. That's common law, and it's, it's pretty common. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that. Uh, uh, Highway authorities aren't in the business of controlling land use. Oh, believe me, we are. Uh, yeah, we'll give you one example. Outdoor advertising, uh, it's, a, it's like a statewide zoning ordinance administered by the state. It's, it's a land use control. Uh, the, in Wisconsin, uh, DOT is what is called an objecting authority for the uh, approval of subdivision plats. Uh, so I, when a, a subdivision abuts a state trunk highway, uh, DOT gets informed of that, takes a look at the plat, and can object to it if it shows for that new subdivision access points which are unacceptable for the state trunk highway system. And DOT reviews it and makes an objection, and then the parties don't get their subdivision plat approved by the government, and they, they cannot proceed. What happens when we object? Well, they generally come in and see if they can come up with an alternative way of doing it. At one time, we also had the authority to re, uh, review certified survey maps before they were recorded as an objecting authority or any other division of property abutting the state trunk highway, but the, our Supreme Court said, uh, or was it the Court of Appeal? It was the Court of Appeals said, you're going too far. Yeah. Your, your express authority is subdivision plats, so stick to that. Yes? Uh, I thought it was 945. Oh. 
I had an old one, sorry. <laughs> I was on time, <laughs> used to be. Uh, okay, what does the permit say? Was it a previous permit issued? Because you issued one before, it doesn't mean you can't change it. Is it transferable? Phil's point, don't make it transferable. Don't re record it, but not in the register of deeds. <laughs> Yeah. So all the permits for people that have transferred didn't buy, they have illegal access. They should come and get a new permit. <laughs> they have illegal access. Not really. No, because they aren't digging in the highway, yeah. but they can't they can't change that driveway without a permit. Yeah. That, that's the way it works in Wisconsin. And you know, this is gonna vary on a state by state basis because this is governed by your state laws and, and so it's gonna be dependent on your state law. Okay. Wrapping it up real quick. We do have official mapping powers too around the interstate interchanges. Uh, is there a process for issuing a ticket for an illegal driveway? There is. You can get the cops out there to issue the ticket. And what is the scope of your statutory power? Thank you much. I'm sorry we ran over. I thought we were well on time. <laughs>